everybody. Welcome back to another episode of DadCast. I am JP. He is Nick. How are you, Nick? You're, you're the right way the first time, but I'm good, man. Well, yeah, so on, your way, screen, on, on your screen. On your screen. <laughs> I, I like the. I love the T-shirt. I went totally unplanned, though. Oh, I know, right? We called each other this morning, man. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of which, uh, this episode is brought to you in part locally by KMVU Fox Twenty Six. If you are enjoying the shirt that we are wearing, you can pick one up at our merch store, DadCast.co. Um, it is just in time for Father's Day. Cheers to Dad Life 24 7 365 dadcast.co. Go check it out on Dadcast today. Very, very special guest. Um, he is host of an incredibly popular podcast, Challenge Mania. Welcome to the show, Mr. Scott Yeager. How are you, man? Hey, it's good to be here. Thanks, guys. All right, all right. Well, glad you are hanging out. Um, I see you, you go pro. We know you're a podcaster if, if you're wearing the cans. I've been yeah, trying well, to get you, Nick to put these things on for like two years, and he just won't do it. You've got the real pro set up because you've got the stationary mic and the cans. I go with the full, you know, uh, telemarketer headset. That way I'm a little <laughs> bit more flexible here. It's always just close to my mouth no matter where I go. Sometimes I record late at night. I'm just hanging back. So, uh, but yeah, it's a version of professional that we Very had to acquire weird. at some point. It's professional enough, man, like for it. what we're doing. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for say. Thank you for coming on, man. So the very, very first and uh, the rite of passage here on DadCast, first question we always like to ask is, <gasps> Nick, ask it. Are you a dad? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> How many kids you got? Names, ages, all that good stuff, Scott. Well, what's so funny is it's May 20th. Uh, so I guess no matter what, I would have been able to say two uh, because our second child our daughter winnie joined us a little early on may 3rd but she was going to come on on may 18th either way so i have two kids i have a three-year-old son named brock and i have a uh, approximately two-week-old daughter named holy winnie. crap congratulations That's awesome. and Thank you. man you are in the thick of it then this is new yeah, this is the most exciting thing I've done uh, in quite a while. So uh, it's just, uh, I don't leave my house anymore. Yeah, we're in the thick of it. Uh, but this is like, uh, it's funny. It's like, I don't know how many times you've had someone on who literally is right in the thrills of rearing a two week old baby. But I can, I can speak from the ground floor uh, of how it's going. I would venture to say the that the first. you are the first to have a child that young and that yeah. new. Uh, we've had a couple, three months four months in, but wow, man. Now, if this was your very first kid, this, this would be fun because you would be sitting here, help questions, yeah. <laughs> but you got one in, in already, you know, you got a little yeah. experience going you know, on. You can drop this one. They bounce. It's all good. <laughs> it is true. It's like, you know, I, you're saying that in jest, but I was, my wife and I have talked a few times about it, how it's like, the first one, everyone, everything feels so daunting. You're overthinking everything. You know, you're overdoing everything. You're taking all these extra steps uh, and whatnot. And then the second one, for whatever reason, she is a lot easier just mentally for us. Right. And it's the same kid. Right. They're the same, you know, types of uh, mammal. Right. The one shouldn't be easier than the other. You should have to put as much effort into either one. But it's all kind of overthinking it the first time and then kind of being able to just like riding a bike, kind of go back to what you learned the first time this time around. So this has felt a, a little different, although it comes with the added, we have a three-year-old that we're simultaneously taking care of. So that kind of negates all that easy stuff, but she has been an absolute dream so far, sleeping well, all that good stuff, knock wood, very healthy. So yeah. I'm going to knock on wood for you as well, because uh, that, that led into my next question. Have you found it that it was different with the second kid? And because we, in our experience, every single child is different, no matter how much you think, I got this. There's going to be no, nope, you know, something happens. It's just complete, especially in a boy and a girl. Wow. Yeah. It's interesting. It's like, uh, you know, as I said, it is in a vacuum, right? So taking my son existing out of it and having that kind of, you know, added workload here, I would say it is completely different in that everything we learned the first time now is kind of second nature, not necessarily in like the work, because you're still doing the same stuff. You're still changing the diapers, still getting up four times a night. But you kind of since you've done it, you're kind of your your brain and your body know like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. Whereas like the first time you kind of like over hype yourself for like, oh, man, what's it going to be like not getting any sleep? Oh, she's crying again. What are you doing? And now I'm kind of on autopilot. Um, and then, like I said, when you throw the monkey wrench, there's my son into it. It does get a little complicated, but as far as she goes, it's almost like I, I forget 
like me, either it wasn't this easy the first time, or I was just an absolute wimp the first time, because right. if it was just her right now, and I didn't have to like, say, you know, take my son to school in the morning, you know, bring him back. And then there's juggling both of them and, you know, his needs and things like that. And making sure he, you know, the first time around, I almost acted as if I was a three-year-old in which, in the sense of that I could be so clumsy at any time with her, like anytime I held her, oh my God, what am I doing? You know, now it's kind of second nature to hold her. When my son holds her, I'm, you know, I'm on edge. Oh my God, what's going to happen? So there are still moments like that. There's still, oh, he's carrying a toy too close to her and whatnot. But the first time around, it was literally anything I or any adult did, I was petrified of. And now I'm kind of like, all right, adults kind of know what they're doing. I kind of know what I'm doing. So I kind of turn my brain off for the most part to that stuff. Uh, yeah. How uh, did your son Brock react uh, when you brought baby girl home for the first time? He, I mean, he's been absolutely adorable and loves her and has been super sweet. Um, he, I mean, you, you hear this and it is definitely true. Like it, it definitely kind of resets, you know, how much he, you know, wants sort of attention, uh, things that, you know, he was almost getting too cool for. He's kind of, you know, reverted back to as far as like wanting to be held a lot, uh, and at very specific times, uh, mainly when I'm holding her things like that. Um, but a lot of it's kind of cool because, you know, he, he's verbalizing, you know, how much he loves like spending time with me and things like that. Um, he obviously, you know, at the, the one thing we had gotten really good about kind of making him sleep in his own bed, um, which for a long time he was coming into our bed. And now this, I think, has kind of maybe put a damper on that because once he wakes up in the middle of the night, not only does he want to come in our bed because it's cozy, but I think there's a little bit of that. Oh, she gets to be in there. Can I be in there? But other than that, I mean, he is, I mean, but absolutely adorable with her. Like, you know, anytime other people are around, he's just doing the cutest things and leaning in for the kiss. And can I hold her and wanting to read to her and things like that anywhere he goes? Oh, I want to get something for my little sister. So, yeah, I mean, I, I cannot complain at all. He's been absolutely great. So that's amazing. My son, uh, he's nine now. Excuse me. He'll be he's 11, be 12 in August. My daughter will be nine. So they got about a three year gap. Um, He wouldn't touch her, barely even look at her for the first two weeks when we brought her home. And uh, that 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 day, that that beautiful day in June, when he finally held his baby sister, we got the pictures. uh, It was amazing. But we we had to work him into it. He was I don't think he was too pleased uh, to start all of a sudden playing second fiddle to baby sister. And it has continued. Um, this, they do love each other, but be forewarned, there's going to be, uh, some difficult times, Scott. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm expecting it at some point and maybe coming and going. And I could tell there's a little bit, I mean, it was the first second we brought her home, he was seemed a little nervous. Almost. He was almost like, kind of like not talking at his full, you know, volume, kind of whispering a little bit. Um, and I can see that that stuff might be in there and might come out at different times, but all things considered, having heard stories like that where it took two weeks and things like, you know, I would say he is definitely a, a among so far the, the the more well adapted siblings of having this this new child thrusted into his life like this. We have done a good job, I think, mentally preparing him for it, or at least I, I would like to think we did um, almost too good of a job because after a while there, he's like, all right, where's this baby you keep talking about? Hello. Um, but now that she's here, I think, you know, he, he's ready to rock for a, you know, at least a large portion of the day. So when you when you when you and your wife found out you guys were pregnant again, did your did your son like how did he feel about that like having his mom with a baby in the inner belly? Like, I think I mean are kind of going through the same thing right now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. He so it's interesting. I mean, something that has kind of helped, I guess, is you know we have a lot of like neighborhood friends. Uh, kids and parents of similar ages who have recently in the last year or so also had kids uh, where he, you know, saw their parent when they were, you know, pregnant. Oh, there's a baby in there. Oh, now the baby's coming and then she's getting bigger and then the baby's here and then seeing those kids with those babies. So he's kind of, and and I'm not saying that that's not sort of common that that happens, but he's definitely had a, a one to, I mean, it's probably about at least five crash courses in that seeing friends okay. adapt to having siblings. So he knows yeah. like sort of the, the geography of it and she's in there and then she's out here and then she's in next to you uh, kind of thing and knows how delicate they are to as much as the three-year-old can. But I, I will say again, like the timetable of it, uh, I don't, I, I think, you know, especially for kids, I think everything, you know, you, you have a kid in the car, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's like, we just left, you know, the time doesn't really make sense to them in the same way. So for somebody to take nine months 
to a kid. I mean, he literally gets introduced to stuff and forgets things that exist within a week. So for something to take nine months, um, I think he had like an under, uh, like a real understanding of it by the end. But also I think he probably uh, at a certain point was like, Hey, get, you know, get off the pot at some point, baby, come on, get it out of here. So um, <laughs> yeah. now that she's here, I think he's excited, but he, he was good the whole time. I would say as far as That's like, cool. you know, being excited. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So my wife and I are doing IVF and we just did our transfer last week. So we're like 98% sure she's pregnant. So our, our son, he's two, he's keeps telling mommy, mommy, my baby sister's coming. My baby sister's coming, you know, kiss her belly and stuff. So yeah, it, it's kind of cool. It's just to see how no, that's, that. Uh, that stuff's awesome. I mean, it's, I, you know, it, and once they sort of get that you like it and, oh, this is the cutest thing. And you take out the phone, say that again, say that again. You know, I think they kind of realize like, okay, this is a good way for me to score points too. Uh, right. But Hey, I'll take it any way it comes. Uh, but yeah. he, you know, Brock certainly does know. And, and again, it was, you know, he, I think oddly enough, and my wife, well, he, he said it a couple of times in front of me, but also when I'm not there, he said a few times already only having a two week old baby. He's already talking about the next baby. When's the next baby coming? You know, and he's, he's already like kind of talking about it. Matter of factly, like when the next baby comes, we should do this or like you know how's that now there's a new baby coming things like that so he's already <laughs> planning are, the next one are are you is it a girl is this a predetermined thing with ibf or no it's not a predetermined thing it's a uh, more of a she's completely different like this up to this point in pregnancy because like when you do ibf you're like four weeks pregnant when they do the the transfer because they let the the egg grow and the embryo and stuff so her, the way she's reacting to it is a hundred percent different than with Liam. So we're like, eh, we're pretty sure it's going to be a girl. And Liam, like, I don't know, like I have this weird thing. I've been reading a lot of stuff where like kids have an intuition where they know certain things. It's kind of like dogs and know if there's like a ghost in your house or whatever. Kids know certain things about stuff and he keeps calling it his baby sister. So it's kind of like, eh, well, so what if, happens if, 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 it's it's not, if it's if it pops out a boy, it's going to have some gender issues down the road, probably. <laughs> a lot of teasing. Not, not today's the, society, from, man. Not today's society. Brother. <laughs> So I always said predicting uh predicting a baby's gender is always like the most it's 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 like it's just win win it's like no one ever remembers you, people only remember the shots that you make nobody's ever like you know the next time you're trying to make a prediction you're like yeah really you're the one who thought Janice was going to be a boy come on really come on I'm going <laughs> to let you I'm going to let you pick the numbers here like you know no one cares unless you do and then then you're always reminding the person remember remember I was the first one who said it was going to be a boy right. and then it's so it's it's like one of those things everybody always says it it's a like 50 50 right it's not right. even like that impressive but uh but yeah i think yeah with, with this one we were really hoping we were uh yeah obviously you don't really you know you're gonna love the baby either way but we were really hoping for a girl so when we found out it was a girl we were super happy yeah you know same with here man two two attempts one boy one girl completed that set good to go completed that set yeah yeah, yeah. rock who who came up with the name and what's is there any any reason behind the name so we, the first, it's, it's funny, uh, my, my, uh, it's funny you asked that. So with Brock, um, we both loved the name equally. I forget who the first person to say it was. I kind of remember me saying it. Um, and, and I remember the joke I made was, uh, and uh, I remember the joke I made being, I just want a name where I can just picture girls huddled around a locker in high school saying, oh my God, guess who asked me to prom? Brock Yeager. Uh, and like, and I think there's just kind of a, a connotation with it. It sounds strong, but it also is like cute for a kid, you know? Um, so right off the bat, we both liked it. We tabled it. It was on our list. And then over the course, and, and this, by the way, this conversation happened when we were like dating, like we weren't even engaged or married and we were already talking kids' names and stuff and had kind of acquired a list um, for boys and girls at the time. And Brock was on it and we came up with all these other names. And then when finally we were pregnant and we were getting down to the wire, we're going through all the names and we're like, what about Brock? Uh, we both liked it. And so uh, we went with it. People think that it has anything to do with the professional wrestler and mixed martial artist Brock Lesnar. Um, I am a very big wrestling fan as well as a MMA fan. So obviously I'm very well aware of Brock Lesnar. Lindsay, I don't know at the time whether she was or not, that might've been a good thing. Um, she certainly knows who he is now. Um, I will say it may have played a part in the sense that like, you know, it's not a super common name yet. It feels very familiar in that, like, no, no matter what, like, you know, we've had a couple of people say, I've never heard that, but for most, for the most part, people have heard the name for as uncommon as it is. And for most people have the same connotation for it. Like, oh, it's a strong name or this, that. And I wonder how much of that subconsciously is that you, 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 if you do know a Brock, it, whether it's Brock Lesnar or uh, I believe there's um, 
There was a, a quarterback on the Dolphins named Brock. There's, I think, uh, Brock Anderson, I believe, is someone who played for the uh, the Red Sox. It's a lot of athletes named Brock. So for whatever reason, it carries that connotation with it. And so subconsciously, Brock Lesnar might affect that. But it's not like I'm like the biggest Brock Lesnar fan in the world, and I wanted to name him after him or something like that. People yeah. do make the joke. People do make the reference. Um, my friends in the wrestling business call me a mark for it uh, because, which is a Ooh. term for like really big wrestling oh, fan. Did that. You don't got to say a word, man. I know yeah. what Mark is. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So uh, he's a big uh, fan. Yeah. And I, wa- I warned, I warned uh, Lindsay. I go, look, I go, if we go with this name and we should, I'm a, people are going to say the, they're going to say Brock Lesnar, just like Winnie. We just named our, our daughter Winnie. People are going to say Winnie the Pooh, which we're big Disney fans as well. So we don't mind that either. But I just wonder, I go, hey, look, I, people are going to say it. And of course they have, and people do the Paul Heyman, Brock Yeager, you know, people do that. Um, but no, not specifically after him, but. I mean, subconsciously, it's like as a kid, like the names I always liked, Randy, Brett, Sean, I'm like, maybe I am getting brainwashed. I don't really realize it. So who knows? That's amazing. I had an Uncle Brock. So yeah, I mean, there you I, go. I, I, and and again, he was a, a very strong male influence. I mean, he yeah. grew up in, in Montana. And one of my first experiences of going out, I think Brock Lesnar lives in Montana. Oddly yeah, enough, yeah, or at least he's up yeah. north. But yeah, yeah it's that, that's that's a Crazy coincidence. Okay, really, so uh, real quick, also there, I, I got to shout this place out in case anyone listening to this is from my hometown of Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, when I was growing up, there were not a lot of restaurants where I lived off of High Ridge Road. Although there are more now, this one restaurant that was right on the corner of High Ridge Road and where the Merritt Parkway is, it was called Brock's, and it was like had a, uh, a uh, four leaf clover there, and it was right next to the AMP, and it was where everyone went. It wasn't even that fancy, but it was like a sit down restaurant. So it was where everyone went, like when you graduated elementary school or if like someone got you know a promotion or some of that it was like the place where families went because they had like a buffet and you could order from the menu which is fancy back then um (laughs) and so maybe subconsciously that was was like oh we're going to brox we're going to brox we're going to brox it's possible that that had something to do with it as well subconsciously but that place has been gone for about uh 15 or 20 years but when i was a kid that was like the only time we had anywhere other than burger king was at brox so maybe that too (laughs) so shout out to anyone who knows what i'm talking about there how long did you live in uh stanford uh, so my parents still live there. I lived there until I went to college in Syracuse after graduating high school. Then after going there for five years, if you're keeping track at home, it took me a little longer. Uh, I moved back home and lived at home in Stanford for, I don't know, I want to say probably like four or five, eh, maybe a little less years where I would commute to New York City because I was working as a production assistant. I was only making about $150 a day. I couldn't really afford to live in New York. So I'd take a train 45 minutes from Stanford and then live there until I ended up moving into New York City, probably when I was like 26 or 27 or something like that. So uh, I've, I lived in Stanford for, I mean, I would say two thirds of my life, you know, and so my parents trips, still live there. We go there all the time. How many trips to WWE headquarters have you made? Well, you go there once and then you find out there's nothing there for you unless you have like an invite. I, right. I did have the pleasure a couple of times of working out in their gym. My friend's dad was a cop and he knew people there. So we would go work out in the gym sometimes and hope we would see somebody we never did. I would run into wrestlers all the time at like the mall and, and, and things like that. But WWE headquarters, unless you have like a job interview or you know someone there or you're taking a tour that's like pre-assigned, like you go there, you're getting in the lobby. That's it. It's not like they have like, you know, the giveaways, whatever. Right. They're, they're, there's really no, it's pretty well locked down. There's like like a private uh, garage and stuff like that. But if you live in Stanford for as long as I did, like you will see, like I would see like Vince McMahon walking around the movie theater. I would see Ken Shamrock walk around the mall. When I went to try the food for my bar mitzvah at the Holiday Inn, uh, we're in the lobby and I see Triple H and China and X-Pac. And I'm like to my parents, I'm like, I don't care how shitty the food is. We're having it here, um, which of course <laughs> made no sense. Like they were going to be, like they would come with the package or whatever. Right. Um, but yeah, so um, but yeah, so you, you don't go there often, but it is right off of the exit nine on I-95. So even if, whether you're in Stanford, which, or in your driving by, or you're just, you know, rocking up and down the Merritt Parkway, going to Boston or something like that, you will see that iconic W uh, and that's cool no matter what. So, so who's your favorite wrestler growing up? Ah, gr- well, growing up, I was a Bret Hart guy. Um, when I was a really young guy, I was, uh, I was a, you know, big into the, like, you know, big jacked up, colorful guys, British bulldog, ultimate warrior, who wasn't a Hulkamaniac staying on the WCW side, you know, basically anybody who, who enabled me to wear like a, a fluorescent colored backpack to school, but still look cool. Um, and then, <laughs> and then once I started understanding wrestling and like, oh, you gotta like make this look good and stuff like that, I really became a big Bret Hart fan, a big Ric Flair fan, but, um, can yeah, you I believe can that today, so. old some bitch is doing another match? 
Yeah, I'm I'm really torn on whether I I mean he's doing it either way, whether I care or not. But I know I, I, it's not something I need. I'm actually we're doing our challenge mania live in Nashville that weekend. So I'm gonna be in Nashville. I probably won't make it to that. Um, because currently I'm scheduled to fly back exactly when that match is taking place. But but yeah, I'm like, I don't know if I need it. You know, I don't know if I need that last uh, Ric Flair match at, at the AG's ad. And after having it, I mean the guy almost died. Uh-huh. Uh, I went to, I, I went to the premiere of the documentary they made uh for on him for ESPN, the 30 for 30, and he wasn't even there because he was literally in the hospital like fighting for his life so he's gonna do it he wants to do it i'm sure it'll be fun for the people that are there um again wasn't something i needed by any means for him to to wrestle again that moment he had which was his first retirement at wrestlemania was at 26 or something like that against Shawn michaels which says yeah. i love you yeah. kicks him perfect would have been the perfect swan song of course there's no, no such thing as an actual retirement in wrestling he has since come back a bunch and done other stuff but People like to remember that retirement. I will choose to do that as well. Uh, but I guess technically, yeah, he's doing it one more time at the Nashville Fairgrounds on July 31st. So, yeah. Good gosh. You know what? You, you inspired me, Nick. I'm going to do it. So I need to I need to walk over there for a sec. Uh, take right. over for literally one minute. Yeah, yeah. I think you know what's coming. You, yeah, you might appreciate this, Scott, but I'll be right back. Okay. All right. <laughs> That's awesome. Only I could turn a dad cast into a de facto wrestling chat by accident. Oh, no way, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, do these all go like this? Is that why? They all go off the rails all the time. <laughs> Good. Okay. Good. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we, we talk about dad stuff, but this is also dad stuff. Our kids need to know about cool shit. Yeah. So. Um, but no, it's funny you know, to go back to just the name thing. It's like, uh, we, we, we had two completely different experiences with that. The, the Brock was fairly e- in retrospect, fairly easy to name. We both really liked the name. So, oh, the spinner belt. <laughs> yes, <at> that. Sir. <laughs> oh my, that's just uh what is that? That is a relic from an era that I was not, you know, I recognize I, th- that was definitely the period of my life where I was the least plugged into wrestling was the ruthless aggression era that that comes from the same for me, but yeah. Uh, this does tie into being a dad. So mm. last year, uh, SummerSlam was in Vegas and I took my son, uh, to his first pay-per-view SummerSlam. It was daddy's first pay-per-view. The first actual live event that second live event that I've been to since I was younger. And, uh, I told him, I said, if daddy hits big on the slots, I'm going to buy you your choice of any authentic championship belt. Mm. And well, Obviously, I hit it big, and this is the one he chose. And uh, I am more private, I think, than he is. That's great. Wait, <laughs> sorry, that's so, I mean, you hit it big on the slots. I don't understand slots. I my I went to a casino recently. I like playing roulette. My my brother in law was like, oh, "Let's play slots." You go sit there. You're just literally pressing buttons so your money's gone. I couldn't even I couldn't fathom what was happening or whatever. But I guess some people like yourself press buttons and then you win, and you're sitting with a spinner belt. I've always <laughs> been a table guy. Uh, you know, especially the blackjack table. Um, and you could spend some time there, you know, ups, your downs, your ups and downs. But my lady, a few times we went, she, all she does is slots. And I and I told her, I'm like, you're not going to win there. You're not going to win doing this. It's just, it's like what you just said. You're just tapping buttons and throwing your money away until 90% of the time she would win. And I went, hmm, there's something to this. And Back in the day, you know, slots were very boring. Nowadays, they're interactive games with bonuses and fun different things that you can do. And I myself have had pretty good luck almost every single time. So now I find myself gravitating towards these slot games whenever we go to Vegas, um, because if you have the proper strategy and you're willing to lose a certain amount of money, it's much more fun. But I mean, I'm going next week. In fact, I'm going to so be in Vegas. Something- are you going for, oh, well, they're doing it again there, not SummerSlam. They're doing uh, Money in the Bank. Money in there, the Bank is in July. Which is ironic because you need to have money in the bank to go to Vegas. But yeah. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, yeah. But I also found out, uh, I was just looking up what was going on in Vegas next week, and uh, AEW is doing two shows. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're yeah, doing, yeah. Uh, they're doing uh, nothing. a Wednesday yeah. and a Friday show. Wednesday, and, Friday, and Sunday, actually. And yeah, on and, Saturday, they have a fan fest. Are you, so you're going to be there that weekend? I'm not. I'm leaving on Friday. I was going to say, cause that's such an expensive, but also, you're there Wednesday though. Yep. You should go Wednesday. Cause I'm that actually, to. cause I'll say, so the, the one on Sunday sold out immediately. The one on Wednesday, just by being a Wednesday in Vegas is probably pretty easy to get tickets to. Um, cause a lot of people are probably just going for the weekend. So you should definitely hit that up. Yeah, AEW I, is, is where it's at. As far as like, I guarantee you, you will have fun at that. WWE's hit or miss, whether it's a good show, you go to AEW, you will have a great time. 
Now, as a wrestling fan, would it be wrong for me to rock this at an AEW show? Yes, uh, it would be. And I'll tell you why. So, uh, well, mm, okay. Because I see plenty of other championship belts at WWE events that aren't, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like the it's okay to punch up but not punch down kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but also there is a uh there is a mulligan or a loophole with a certain level of nostalgia. So for instance, I went to AEW a couple of weeks ago. I wore a Mr. Perfect uh chalk line jacket, which is a very gaudy sort of uh image filled, it's just a big picture of Mr. Perfect on my back, right? Right. Uh, because to me, there's truly no better feeling than walking around a wrestling event with a, a jacket like that. You feel like you're a a, a bride on her wedding day at the amount of times people compliment at you right right um and so people might think oh mr perfect he's a wb guy but he is sort of be like if you're of a certain era of the past almost everything either wwe wcw doesn't matter belongs to like wrestling culture right so which AEW is clearly a part of and respect so that almost i think might be okay the only problem is is that that belt and that era and john cena is sort of so quintessentially modern wwe it's almost kind of I don't want to don't take this the wrong way. Kind of cringe that you almost might be conceived as like wearing it as kind of like, uh, oh, I'm a WWE because it's the big WWE logo spinning on it, whatever. But if you were rocking like an old wing eagle that like the title Hogan had oh, or yeah. an old white strap IC title, people wouldn't care at all. But that one or like the modern WWE one, I think might get some side eyes. Right. And those are the only yeah. two ones that I have, of course. <laughs> yeah, you got that one behind you too. So that's what I would say. Just the same way I would say, if you were asking me, hey, can I wear my Roman Reigns shirt? I'd be like, sure, but uh, people are going to be like, all right, well, I wore the Roman Reigns shirt. But if you were wearing a Roddy Piper shirt, people would be like, awesome shirt, bro. Exactly. So so that's and, kind of the line. And I for guess. the record, this one, I, I I call it CM Punk and or Edge's belt, not Cena, even though Cena is the most popular one. Who, if Punk um, walked out and was close enough to you to see that, he would probably smirk or laugh if he yeah. saw that i would say oh we hope so nick i know we're talking about wrestling i apologize that's all good <laughs> he's uh but so uh we've got a buddy brian hopkins who uh lives in vegas he's in the band elvis monroe he's appeared in saved by the bell he's he's a pretty popular guy in the vegas era also he our manager. <laughs> texted me he's he's also our man i kind of try to leave that one out nick but <laughs> yes he is one of our managers he uh texted me not an hour ago he and I'm not going to mention names because that would be wrong. And I don't know if he would approve of that. But many years ago, I'm thinking 10 or so, give or take, he was engaged to a diva. I'm not going to mm. name who. Okay. Um, so he got to go, you know, you know, he, he lived that life. He, he met all the people. Long oh, yeah. story short, he has Chris Jericho's phone number. Oh, yeah. And I said, all oh. right, uh, <laughs> AEW is going to be in town next week. I, I, I rarely ask you to uh, pull the favor card, but could you give the man a call? Because I would really, really like to a meet him and and try to get him on the podcast, of course. Um, So I'm waiting. And I got that text about 30 minutes ago saying he, uh, he called and texted Jericho and and we'll find out and see what happens, but he's going to be in town next week. I'm going to be in town next week. Fingers crossed. Boom. Let's see what happens. Talk about Fozzie. So that's great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I will bring that up first because I'm a big Fozzie fan. I, yeah. I I dig that band. That's that is a true story. Is your uh, is Brock a wrestling fan? So we that's an interesting question. So we have currently not exposed him to the wacky and wonderful world of professional wrestling. We're kind of. Uh, attempting to kind of dose him with uh, certain types of entertainment when appropriate and at certain ages and stuff. Now we went to Disney world in uh, January. And so we kind of selfishly, because we wanted to like recognize him to recognize stuff and characters and stuff like that. Over the course of last year, we were just like force feeding him Disney plus like, you know, every pretty right. much any old school animated movie, the new school Pixar movies and things like that. So he's in love with toy story and all that stuff. Um, Sports wise, you know, we tried to get him into the sports we like, you know, hockey and baseball, basketball, and the one that we were kind of keeping on the back burner because, you know, my wife especially didn't love the idea of like concussions and things like that was football. (laughs) Now, of course, that's the one that we weren't really pushing on him. And that's the one that all of a sudden one day he just like, I love football. I want to play football, 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 football. So weird. So again, he's kind of now he's got the football thing going. I took him to a Yankee game. He's into that. Recently, we started showing him Star Wars. And again, I don't know if it was the best idea. We both love Star Wars. He's already got Star Wars stuff on the wall. He's already been to Galaxy's Edge. But I will say 
he's now he's got like because you know in star wars although they're blasters they're not like you know it's not like they're ak-47s but there are guns you know there's violence things like that so but it has given him a little extra so Again, I think that's the fear with the wrestling stuff is the recreation of it and the 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 perceived yes, they're just playing, but if none of the other kids know what he's doing and all of a sudden he comes up at the playgrounds trying to give him a spine buster, you know, who knows? So <laughs> that's the one, as much as obviously it's a big part of daddy's life, we have yet to introduce that to him. I find it hard, hard to believe it could be hidden from him uh forever. Um, however, probably what'll end up happening is he'll see what a big dork I am and he'll want nothing to do with it anyway, at least at some age. So um at that at, at some point he'll probably figure out what it is. And it's funny, it's like like he um one day I was wearing like an Ultimate Warrior shirt. He was like, Who's that on your shirt? I was like, Ultimate Warrior, what's he do? He's a wrestler. And uh, and and he goes, and and this is like it's so funny how kids, it's like what they retain and what they know. And he goes, He's the guy you give the tickets to. And I think what he re- was retaining was I think uh, times that I'm like buying tickets. And Lindsay will probably would tell him like, oh, he's buying tickets to wrestling. And so like he doesn't even know what wrestling is, but right. he knows that I buy tickets and I go to wrestling. So literally he saw a picture of a wrestler and thought that's the guy you give tickets to. Like that's what he thinks wrestling is, is just getting tickets at this point. <laughs> that's good parenting right there. Yes, sir. Uh, so I mean, your question. So not yet. No, 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 I I can't wait for you for that first experience, man, because, you know, it's like it kind of comes full circle. Once you get there, you know, you're, oh, you're, I know. You're, you're yeah, 11, yeah. 12 years old. My, let's see, my son was seven or eight when we took him to that first, very first, it was a, it was a road to WrestleMania event up in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, I did a vlog about it. It was one of my first vlogs that I did when I jumped into the world of video editing. And uh, at the end of it, we were ringside and uh, Roman Reigns, he got a, he got a, you know, a, a knuckle, a hand, a high oh, five. Yeah. And I caught the moment and the look on his face afterwards was just, I mean, to this day, I mean, it's almost bringing me to tears right now thinking about just, I was able to provide that for him and Roman was cool enough and we were in the right moment and the right time, but, and I got it on video. So it's all, it's just forever and ever and ever. It, it you go back and watch that. It was, I'm, I'm excited for you. That's what I'm yeah, saying. I, when that I do really look forward to that stuff because it's so funny. A lot of the stuff that I like, I'm 36 years old, but I'm a 36 year old child. Uh, not even when they say, oh, a child at heart. No, like if you just look at my hobbies and interests and the things I collect and whatnot, I'm not even just a child at heart. I'm literally a child. Like when I go to a target, I go to the toy. Aisle. Like I might be there for a practical good, but I'm just like, no matter what I'm walking through the toy aisle, I got to see what they're doing. Um, you know, and, and I'm the guy, like I want to get to the baseball game early to get them to sign the balls. And I'm waiting after the Broadway show to get the playbill sign and all that stuff that of course is awesome for the kids too. Some kids might have to like convince their dads to do that. Brock's not going to have to do that. I'm going to know all the tricks and things like that. I'm an adult. I do it without a kid. I'm the guy who's the I'm I'm over there. I'm the adult. And I'm like watching them go over to sign the kids thing first. And I'm like, man, I can't wait to have a kid. Then they'll come over to me quicker. You know, but like, <laughs> but, but in addition to that, you know, I, I took my nephew who now is funny. He's a little older. So I think he doesn't really like wrestling anymore, but he was going through this pocket of time where he liked wrestling. I took him to a WrestleMania and we did the whole, you know, st- stayed at the WWE hotel, uh, which to be honest with you, saved me a lot of money because it was in Orlando. So otherwise I probably would have had to take him to Disney world and stuff like that. Instead, we just hung out at the hotel all day and it was like Disney world. Cause instead of goofy walking around, it was all these goofy wrestlers. But they were all super sweet to him. He was like, I think he was eight or nine at the time. Um, and he's doing the pictures and this and that and, and just loving it. And again, like, you know, again, again, I'm not I am not uh, prideful to enough to say that I wasn't getting a kick out of it, too. Right. I'd probably be doing that anyway. But to see him getting the the love out of it, because he at that age, it's a weird mixture, especially with wrestling. Same thing with movies, too, where it's like they know for the most part that it's it, it's a performance, but there's still a level of like. Oh, that's the person for my TV, which we as adults have. But we also, you know, you if you look at the Internet, you can see that, like, you know, adults, we, we do get to this place where we still have to, like, tear people down and we have to be like, oh, you stink and blah, 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 because it's important. It's hard to just, like, appreciate somebody for what their talent is and not have to try to tear them down. But kids have such just wide eyed way of appreciating everything that if they've only seen something in a one dimensional way, which is like that's the guy who does the superhero stuff, or that's the guy who jumps off the top rope, or that's the guy who wears the cool stuff. And then all of a sudden they're in front of them. Like there is, and there is this really cool thing. My son at Disney world, these aren't even real. It's not even really Mickey mouse. It's a guy named probably James in a Mickey mouse costume. Right. And he would meet Mickey mouse and he'd ask him a question. He'd wave, he'd blow him a kiss. And then the next day we'd be at a different park, probably a different Mickey mouse. This guy's name is Kevin. 
in a Mickey Mouse costume and he would wave him at Brock and Brock, would be like, he remembered me. He remembered me. And so that just that level of acknowledgement from this mouse that is just a mouse that he's seen in cartoons and on posters and things like that. It's something that eventually goes away. Like eventually I know that's Kevin or that James. Right. But but there is a pocket of time where you, you, you know, it's not like it's not like he doesn't inherit. He, he does know that's not a mouse, right? Like he knows it's like this weird combination of a person and a character or whatever, but it's still special and it's still different to him. And so there's that, that, that time where they're old enough to recognize who it is and, and whatnot, but they're not so old that they're just over it. No, really? I just want to be a dad. I, I'm on TikTok here. Come on. Okay. I don't care. We want, okay. Randy Orton won again. I don't care. You know, and that pocket of time, I just cannot wait for it. You know, whether it's with Disney or, you know, movie stars or actors or athletes or wrestlers or whatever, going to the game, this, and that um i can't wait for that so i've you know i've started it we went to a yankee game a few weeks ago he's done disney world things like that he's just starting to get old enough to appreciate it but like once he really understands it that's gonna be awesome that's and that's right where i'm at right now uh yeah. we went to disneyland God, a month two ago um built lightsabers as you can see over there oh yeah the galaxy's edge you know the whole drill um, i'm saving that like we did that we went to galaxy's edge and as you know, because you have a couple of them behind you, those are pretty expensive. Uh, yeah, yeah, as well, are, at five, yeah, I get it. Well, you'll as are that. the as are the joys and stuff. So we're saving that for when he's a little older, um, when Winnie's a little older, um, and they can appreciate it because you know we would have been doing that and pretending it's for him. We'd be like, all right, now we're gonna whatever, have a three hundred dollar lightsaber, or whatever. Um, but so the stuff like that, we, again, we, it's like saving some stuff, you know, for when he's older and can appreciate it when Winnie's older. Which it was very important to us to get this trip in with Brock before uh when he was born because a selfishly we kind of wanted to get the trip in and we knew like once we have her it's going to be a while before we can kind of do anything like that but also just to have like one trip that like where it's like just us and him and to kind of for him to be able to appreciate it and you know he can kind of dictate what we do and things like that because as much as he does i mean look look don't get me wrong he loves frozen as much as any boy or girl he loves all that stuff but at some point he is going to have to be sharing uh what we do next with you know not just me and my wife but with winnie too maybe she likes this he wants to do this you know who knows and maybe he's the one saying let's go on frozen again and she's the one who wants to go to galaxy's edge who knows but either way you know so we wanted to give him the one time where it was all about him um and we're glad we did that we got it in like just under the wire so that's awesome and for the record i am as big as as a uh, self-proclaimed like you said dork as you are um and a child i am a man child to the to the extreme who who's now a little bit more responsible than he un- when he was younger years, you know, you got to pay the bills and support the kids, but I'm all but that's about the fun the of it. It's like, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's the stuff. It's so, it's so weird how life works where it's like when you, when the, you know, when you want this stuff, but it'd be age appropriate. Oh, it's like, you can't afford it. Like you have to wait for somebody to hand you money to get something. Or like, you have to ask your parents for something. And he's lucky that he has a parent who understands this. My parents didn't understand it. I would tell my mom, I wanted this green day album and she would buy me the wrong green day album. Or I would tell my parents, I want this toy. And they would get me the toy from the wrong movie and the, the, the wrestling toy I already had or whatever. Right. So, you know, Brock's not gonna have to worry about that but he doesn't even have to worry about telling me because I probably already have it in the closet. That's what I do now. Sometimes is I'll, I'll tell him, Hey, I'll give you a toy. And I just go in the closet and have a toy that I already have and give it to him. So my son reignited my passion for uh, Legos that I forgot that I had. So uh, last week I literally, literally built a Lego tie fighter and bought him Luke's X wing. And now of course he wants the $800 millennium Falcon and the thousand uh, dollar freaking galactic star cruiser. Mm. I, and I of course want the $900 death star. It's, <laughs> See, I'm looking forward to how old are you? you said five, right? No, no. He Sawyer is uh, he'll be 12 in August 12. So yeah. that's I was going to say. So 12. I'm right. I'm looking forward to that age to actually rekindle my love of Legos, because right now we're at the age yeah. where I have he has sparked my hatred of Legos. Right. And I now floor. look at. I look at Legos the way that Harry and Marv from Home Alone look at Legos, which are tiny little weapons placed on the floor to yes. kill me. And uh, <laughs> which, ironically, my son has seen Home Alone and he's obsessed with Harry and Marv. But these Legos, all he does is pour them out on the floor. Uh, he never builds anything worth anything, but then just leaves them there. And then well, I'm on the phone, whatever. Oh, and, I, and I step on the Lego. So that's where we're at now. I am looking forward to, however, when we can start constructing things. And then, of course, go down the deep rabbit hole of buying these monstrous monstrous film props and whatnot that, that are made out of tiny Legos, but there's a Lego land too, that we're considering going to. Yep. Um, have you been there? Um, it is in, uh, there's a cave, there's a cave, cave. It's still in California. Uh, I forget the name of the city, but I have not been, but it's funny. You mentioned that my son, when he came home yesterday from the bus out of nowhere, I'm sitting behind the computer and he says, dad, look up Legoland right now. That's where I want to go for my birthday. 
and his birthday's coming up in August. And I was like, okay, I could probably swing that. And after looking it up, I said, are you sure you wouldn't rather do Disneyland again? Cause it's the same price and we can do a whole lot more. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's yeah, I have not been, but you know, we're probably gonna go check it out. You know, while he still wants to, he's like, he said, he's in that very, we don't get much time in this, you know, in, in a year from now, he's probably going to really start the throes of puberty and, not the, the, the things of, he says, think that's too childish. And then those kid like, and start gravitating towards more, you know, adult things. And it was, it's a very, I got a year, maybe. I, I can tell you hundred percent, man, my, my 14, 15 year old. Now, as soon as he hit 13, it was no more Legos, no more toys. It's the expensive video games. It's R rated movies. It's yeah. dad. I got to do, I want to watch what you're watching. I want to watch yeah. Rambo. Well, for the record, he still loves the video, the expensive video games. Yeah. That's he's had that since he was six. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's like it's it's you can't go to Walmart and buy a seven dollar Lego anymore and he can have him be stoked about it. It's like right. I need the $85 video game, Dad. It's like Damn. and pro tip, Scott. Nick ain't kidding. Pro tip. You have three years from literally <laughs> this moment in time to tell Winnie that the dollar store is actually the toy store and get yeah. away with it. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's Back. good. Well, and, I will say, and, and also stay away from Coco Melon. Just well, fine. yeah, we we <laughs> did not get to Coco Melon with Brock, which is good. I've tried to stay away. This is the thing with 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 Brock is we have tried to like curate what he watches in the sense of like like he's probably going to watch, but we've successfully so far avoided for the most part Paw Patrol, Coco Melon, all the kind of off brand. Like I know now they are brands because so many kids watch them, but like to me, we try to like. Uh, although I probably should be having to watch that because I, I I let him watch like Jurassic Park, Camp Crustaceous on on Netflix because I'm like, oh, that's IP I like, but it's like super violent. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, it's like we we go with like the watch Toy Story, watch Bugs Life, watch that, watch the like sort of Disney basic because that is going to lead to oh, we go to Disney World and you know these characters and it's all kind of part of this thing that kind of has a connective tissue to us. The stuff that's like only been around for six years, I don't know. Maybe I'm selfish, but since I don't have a connection to it. I'm kind of like, I don't want my son to like be obsessed with something that I'm going to have to just like, you know, Oh, I guess, yeah, we can go to that thing that like didn't exist five years ago. It's not like the biggest thing ever, you know? Um, so <laughs> I do kind of try to, you know, mold him a little bit to the things that, you know, has a, like today there's this new Chippendale movie on Disney yeah. plus. It's supposed to be like self-aware and it's kind of, you know, Seth Rogen is in it and things like that. So we're going to watch that because, you know, it's Chippendale it's a kid's movie, but it's also kind of, you know, making fun That's of crazy. My, my two year old has been talking to, we bought him all the Disney toys at Costco last time we were down there. Yeah, this book with a bunch of little Disney figures and Chip and Dale are his favorite. I'm like, dude, Chip and Dale coming out on Disney Plus. So it's like the last week is Chip and Dale out? Is Chip and Dale? Can we watch Chip and Dale? Yeah, it's on. I think it's coming out. Came out today. Finally, this morning, I'm like, bro, we got it. Chip and Dale. We did it. Daddy gets off work. I put that stuff in the calendar. Like it's a Super Bowl. (laughs) It's like, well, I'll be looking through the calendar and it'll literally just be like, yeah, uh, Sneakerella is uh, is, is debuting (laughs) on, uh, on Disney Plus. We are six days and 12 hours away from Obi-Wan, my friends. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. That Chris should be good. My boy. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> the, uh, the funny thing about you mentioned like the dollar store stuff. They, I mean, dollar stores as well, but even just like Walmart and Target, which are like practical places you would need to go like grocery shopping or like stuff around the house. The toy aisles to, at these stores now are to me as, as equipped almost as like what a Toys R Us was minus some of the stuff, but like they are as equipped, like they almost feel like a toy store, right? When I was a kid, you had to specifically go to the toy store to get toys, right? You might have like one or two toys available somewhere else, but like, so I think that's super convenient because you, you don't have to go to now, granted now, because of this, the toy stores are out of business. There's no such thing as KB toys or toys R Us, So that kind of stinks, but it is, I think very convenient that you can kind of, Oh, you're in the thing. Oh, you're, you know, you know, okay, well, let's go. And you do have your favorite stuff in aisle seven, which is before it'd be like, actually, don't you want this? Uh, you know, uh, it's a Windex, but if we pour out the water, you could use it as a squirt gun. That's like the only thing they have, you know? So I do think that, and you, like you said, the dollar stores in the, with the five belows of the world and things like that, like they have a good selection, right? Like you can go, you go to some of these stores and this it's cheap and it's available and it's easy to get. Whereas when I was a kid, it was like, I mean, it was like a field trip to go and get a, a toy, especially yeah. like a, a toy you wanted, right? Like, Mm-hmm. Not like a yo-yo you could get anywhere. You know? And I was all about G.I. Joe, Transformers, and Mask. Mm-hmm. I know I, that may date me a little bit, but Masks were the uh, vehicles that churned into other vehicles. Mm-hmm. So a yep. boat could be a plane and a plane could be a car or whatever. Though Those were my big three growing up. And uh, yeah. you could only get them at Toys R Us. Yep. 
Yeah, R.I.P. I, I loved a good Toys R Us. Uh, although I do feel like they, it's so funny. It's like, now you realize why they went out of business. Like they take up so much space and how many aisles did you really go down? Right. Like for me, it was two. It was like, there was like the one, it was like action figures. It went all the way to like, you know, the, what are they called? The remote control cars. Cool. And then I'm like, kind of done. Then there's like a lot of bikes and things yep. and, and like, and then you get on this side and it's like, it, it starts at action figures. It becomes more like big things. And then all of a sudden you got like baby stuff. And then you're like, and what's on the out the video? It was always so disappointed to buy a video game at one of those places because you just go and get a piece of paper, right? Yeah, like you're not right? actually picking up. Yeah, you know, I have this piece of paper that my parents are going to re- redeem after waiting on a long line. Or like that's not a very fun getting a video game experience. Yeah. Like I'll take this certificate, you know. And then you get to the top of the thing. Oh, they're out of it. Sorry, you know. Man, see see what happens when we talk. Man, we should maybe have a second podcast, Nick, where it's all about pop culture and wrestling and Star Wars. <laughs> Because we could talk still, forever. Can We're, bad thing. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. But I, I, I gotta, I, I have to ask because I can, I, I can, I can stay for another ten minutes. Where I have to pick up my son, but I can, I can hustle. So we're good. Cool, cool. We started. We, well, started we got about another ten minutes anyway. But I, I wanted to touch on Challenge Mania before. Um, yeah. uh, so talk to yeah. us about your podcast, man. Well, first of all, how did you get into it? Because you've never been on the challenge. Right? No, I've never been on the yeah. challenge. I worked in reality TV for 10 years and uh, mainly kind of docuseries, not necessarily big uh, competition shows, although I did start off working on a few. Um, Derek and I knew each other through a mu- mutual friend. Uh, we connected. Um, so my kind of segue, uh, the, the, the kind of cross pollination is. Two things, experiences I had is that I worked in reality TV, which didn't necessarily prepare me for this in, in a way, but it's where I met the guy that uh, introduced me to Derek. And back 10 years ago, I was also doing podcasting very early on when like, you know, podcasting was not what it is today. It's not like everyone and their mother had a podcast, but, you know, Joe Rogan had his and Bill Simmons had his Adam Carolla had his and, you know, every so once in a while, someone would start up a podcast, but it wasn't the same thing. Um, and I was doing a podcast where it was basically the biggest get- guest I could get. I called it a shot of Yeager. And I was, uh, since I was also the managing editor of the sound magazine, I would interview a lot of musicians, comedians, um, things like that. A lot of big names, you know, uh, Slash from Guns N' Roses, Sebastian Bach, Bill Maher, um, you know, Kevin Bacon, but it didn't really get any traction. And I kind of, you know, eventually I just put it on the back burner as a hobby. And then it kind of kind of drifted away as I started getting promoted in the production world and just didn't have the time to do it. Right. Um, but back in that time period, Derek and I were introduced because he was trying to do this thing called Ultimate Challenge Radio. This is back when he was on the show the first time. Um, and we like pow out. We did a few podcasts together. We saved each other's info. We'd catch up every few years. We never even met. We just kind of did that. This is back in like 2009 or 10 or 11. Um, and then flash forward to 2017, I just left my job. I was going to go get married, take a few months off. He had gotten back on the challenge after a seven year hiatus. He left, he had a son, he worked in the oil fields. Um, and he hit me up. He's like, would you want to do a challenge podcast? I thought I'm going to do this for three months as just kind of a side thing and then go back to work. But what happened was, is I was just kind of tracking the numbers and seeing how popular it was and getting all the social media traction, all this stuff that the first time I was doing the podcast wasn't there. So I saw the difference. I was like, oh, this is actually what a podcast that people are listening to feels like. You know, Um, The other one I was doing was a podcast that like some of my friends and family were listening to and maybe like occasionally some random fans of the person I would have on, but not like a consistent, this is what people are talking about. Uh, it just landed at a great time. There weren't a lot of podcasts in the challenge market. Derek's a very well-liked figure, both by the cast members and fans alike. So it took off. Um, I told my wife, I said, hey, give me a year. If by the end of the year, I'm not making as much doing this as it was as a line producer, I'll go back to production. By the end of the year, we were. So ever since then, we've still been doing it. Um, the podcast itself um, is, of course, a podcast. It's free. It's on iTunes and Spotify and all that good stuff. Um, we still do that once a week. We also have a Patreon which um, is a subscription based podcast where people support us anywhere from a dollar up to a hundred dollars. We do added things like we do a bonus podcast every week. We do brunches, we do zooms, we do contests, we do pre-sales for our live shows. Um, And then we also do a touring live show called challenge mania live, which is something a lot of what I stole, I stole from to start challenge mania. And I shouldn't say stole, but borrowed were things I learned from podcasts. I already, I was already listening to from the sports world, the wrestling world. Um, And I kind of took what this guy, Conrad Thompson was doing in the wrestling world, which was, putting podcasts up and doing this podcast, but also adding this three-dimensional experience where you can be part of a community. You can go, you can meet these people, you can make friends along the way. And it's all part of this thing that you can actually, you know, yes, you watch the show at nine o'clock on a Wednesday, but yeah, a, a million people watch the show and go to sleep. But what if you don't want to go to sleep? If you're the person who wakes up the next day saying, I want to hear people talk about this, chances are you're the kind of person who might want to go hang out with these people on a Saturday, or you might want to listen to a second podcast on a Friday. So, um, 
that's kind of what I do now. I obviously have other things as well. And I still kind of dabble in production and I'm developing a show right now, oddly enough about wrestling. I do voiceover work, uh, but challenge mania is my full-time gig. And we've kind of, we've expanded it to where now we do a survivor podcast. My wife and I, we just put up a Disney podcast today. I do a wrestling podcast called the heel world. So uh, yeah, but I, as I said, when we started challenge mania, it was not a crowded market. Now uh, podcasts in general, but specifically the challenge world is loaded with challenge podcasts. Johnny bananas has one one uh the challenge started one the official challenge podcast um with which anisa and tori host um mark long is now doing kind of a pseudo podcast a live broadcast over on spotify live so there's a lot of other options out there so it's good that we had a four-year head start um and i mean that sincerely because we've built up a lot of loyalty with the people who listen to us and support us and things like that and you know truthfully if we were starting today it would probably be impossible um but because we have that four-year runway um and we've i think done a good job of you know earning people's loyalty not just with the podcast but with the communication uh, with the live shows, with the merchandise, with the back and forth. Um, I think that we're here to stay for, for at least a few more years, if not longer. So, um, yeah, it's been a good time and I get to do fun stuff. Like talk to, talk to you guys. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's really, you know, um, it's been something I've always wanted to do and kind of, you know, as far as like do what would have been radio and then early would have been podcasting. And I will say people ask me all the time, what would you recommend? How do you get into podcasting? Things like that succeeding in it monetarily. Like it is a, a crap shoot and B sometimes it takes something as simple as like having a celebrity co-host, like as good as I can be at my job or want to be, or strive to be at my job. What really mattered when we started this thing is that the guy sitting next to me who had no podcast experience for the most part, other than the ultimate challenge radio thing he did was that he was on the show we were talking about. He was friends with the people we were booking. These people spent 10 years watching him on TV and we're going to support anything he would do at least to start. So it's like how if you're a famous person, you're doing stand up comedy uh, comedy. They always say the first five minutes are easy, but then you got to make them laugh. And with us, it was like the first few episodes, people were probably listening because, oh, cool, Derek has a podcast. But to keep right. people around for four years, we've had to adapt. We've had to get creative. We've had to get professional and headsets. And uh, we've had to keep reinventing the wheel and spice things up, find ways to reinvigorate the audience and our guests, things like that. So it is something that I was kind of born to do because the skill sets that I learned when I was a production manager and a line producer, coupled with the three years I spent podcasting for fun and to go back to the nerd stuff, literally all I do and all I think about when I'm putting together a podcast or a live show or a plan or an idea is what would I want, right? Because I, when I'm done, when I'm going to pick up my son at school, what am I putting on? I'm going to put on a podcast, you know, um, what am I going to next week? I'm going to see a live podcast, you know? Um, and so I just basically think, what would I want out of this? Who would I want to meet? What would I want it to be like when I meet them? And I kind of just try to apply that to everything we do. And if Scott Yeager would be happy with what we're putting out, then chances are there's some challenge maniacs that would be too. There you go. Hey, Nick, sound familiar? You need yeah. you need a get uh, you need a guest that has some kind of celebrity in him. <laughs> ah, I just play. It's kind of fun. Uh, on a much smaller scale. That that is almost the blueprint for Dadcast. Mm -hmm. um, I have worked in radio here in Southern Oregon for twenty years. Production director, program director. I mean, the whole gamut. Kind of like you, and uh, it got the experience. And Nick came at me and said, let's do a podcast. You know, when the pandemic started, we had thought of a good theme. We're both dads and uh, frick, man, two years later, here we are rocking and rolling, man. It's, yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty yeah, awesome. We never really expect, well, we knew it was going to get big, but never as fast as it did. And uh, like, I, you know, JP is great. Cause he was like the number one radio host in the Valley for 20 years. So like everybody knows him in Southern Oregon, which is awesome. So I thought, you know, we'll be Southern Oregon huge. <laughs> That'll be cool. And then, you know, we, we got worldwide huge. And yeah, worldwide huge. that pandemic, man, it's like not not to say in any way the pandemic is a, a good thing. It was an awful thing, but it both it sounds like it inspired you guys to do this. But also, I think it by nature forced the world to get kind of like very digital, very remote. Uh, and people started kind of be, again, it's a lot easier to, you know, the, just the idea of podcasts, I think, expanded so many people. This, depending on how you look at it, is a good thing or a bad thing, because so many people, so many movie stars, right? Who couldn't go to movies were like, I'm going to start a podcast. Like John right. Krasinski started a news show in his basement and Conan O'Brien and Michelle Obama started a podcast. It's like if Bruce Springsteen was doing a podcast, you know what I mean? This is that silly little, you know, thing that a few years ago, people were like, oh, it's like, uh, it's right. It's like, you know, bootleg radio, but now it's the opposite because the fact that you can be doing it in Oregon and still reaching people in Thailand, that is the thing that makes it great. And people didn't understand that. They thought, oh, it's too easy. It can't be good. Right. Yeah. 
get almost you, ha- you have to go into a studio and you have to have traffic and weather together and you have to be uh, going to commercial in five seconds giving out concert if tickets and actually wait it has none of that how are you gonna do with that oh. actually that's what makes it better is we don't have that because <laughs> it's right. not corporate and yeah. there's not all these analysts telling you how to do it and when to god you're speaking my language right now <laughs> yeah oh. yeah and it's fine it's it really here. also yeah can, no, I, I, can, yeah can i can i plant the seed to have you on again sooner than later um oh, because i know we're running out of time but we have so much more to talk about <laughs> Absolutely. We barely talked about my uh, my new daughter, who I will admit I two know. weeks in doesn't have yeah. that much going on. She's adorable. She's a nice little potato. Uh, she smells great. Um, she's being <laughs> adorably silent in the next room right now. Um, but I will say because of that, I do have quite a bit of time to do stuff like this. I'm pretty much, you know, at home 99% of the time these days. So yes, hit me up if you guys have, I know you guys have a loaded schedule because at first you were like, yeah, we can take you on uh, August 3rd at 4 p.m. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, wow. Uh, so if you do have something to open up sooner, yes, let me know. Uh, I can probably make it happen um but i i want to say because you did ask about brock's name i want to say so winnie's full name is bronwyn uh which is a beautiful name that my my wife suggested i instantly loved uh and what i love about the combination because winnie of course um we have a connection to because we uh, at our wedding we had uh people have passages passages read at their wedding we actually randomly uh had a passage read from winnie the pooh was read at our wedding ceremony we in no way at that time knew we were going to name our daughter winnie but my my wife had suggested two names one winnie and one Bronwyn. And when then we thought of, well, what about she can have both, right? We call her Winnie. If when she grows up, she prefers to go by Bronwyn. We can decide based on maybe she's in trouble. And that day she's Bronwyn, Jade Yeager, get down here. But, right. you know, right. Or okay. having fun calling her Winnie. Brock calls her Winnie. So, um, so her full name is Bronwyn Jade Yeager. Uh, I just wanted to get that out there too. Cause we spent so much time talking about Brock's name and I, I don't know if you were going to ask about Winnie's name, um, but I wanted to get it in there cause we kind of went on the wrestling tangent. So the last thing I wanted to do was like, Hey, I went on the podcast talking about his son and then wrestling for 40 minutes. <laughs> right. Well, that's my fault, man. I got, you know, I took the ball and I ran and I ran hard. Um, Bronwyn, I feel like she uh, belongs in Game of Thrones. Yes. Well, we are bit, we are both very big Game of Thrones fans. It's actually, it's Welsh, I believe. Um, and yeah, it does sound like something out of, out of, Lord Game of, of the Thrones Rings. for sure. Yeah. Or, or yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, uh, we love that. And we like, it actually has a nice ring to it with Brock too. Brock and Bronwyn, so, um, you know, very cool. Are there, are there, uh, more kids in the future? Is it a possibility? Yeah, I think it's definitely a possibility for sure. Are you going to stick um, to the bees? I don't know. Well, so is my wife, my wife's uh, mother, who's sadly no longer with us. Her name was Billy. So although we didn't necessarily intend it to begin with, um, it's obviously great to be a tribute to her that or Brock's name starts with a B. And then when we ended up settling on Bronwyn as well, we were like, oh, B again. Great. Do we go with the third with the B? I don't know. I would say I don't want to speak for my wife, but I would say that I don't think we're going to like limit ourselves to only names with a B, right? Um, It's possible if we have two we really like and one of them is a B, one of them is not, it could maybe be the tiebreaker one way or the other. Maybe we go, we go with the B, so we have three Bs. Maybe we go, we don't go B. Um, But I think both ways, uh, like we're probably going to go with the name that we both love the most, whether that's a B or not. And if it is, then great. We have, you know, we have three Bs, which, you know, ironically looks a lot like one of my report cards when I was growing up. (laughs) Scott Yeager from Challenge Mania a podcast and many other great things. Uh, I have one final question for you. What is one bit of advice or wisdom that you could impart on any new father out there? Oh, wow. Any new father? First time? First time father? Yes. Hmm. Okay. Any wisdom that I would impart on a first time father? Change all the diapers, right? You're going to get, obviously, there's going to be some that someone's going to ask you to change. Definitely change those, but also just change all the diapers, right? Like they're easy, especially early when ironically they mean the most. It's basically mustard, right? Yeah, and just yep. like, just, just anytime you pick her up, oh, you're going to feed her, are you going to do this? Stop at the thing, change the diaper. It's so easy. You get down, it's like this, you know, whatever, boom, boom, boom. It's like putting together, uh, putting together a little you know, stamp, yeah. whatever, blah, 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 putting together some mail. It's so easy. It's like clockwork. It's an easy thing to do. Um, and But yet it's something that can take so much other work and stress off the table for your wife or for whoever, you know, actually, if there's someone that you're paying to change the diapers, you can have them change the diapers. But if not, and in the middle of the night and things like that, change all the diapers. When I hear about like people not change, I'm like, it's so easy, like among the things that you get credit for, because 
at some point, your wife or your partner or your husband will be out there and be like, you know, changed a lot of diapers. And then that will make you sound like the best person in the world. And it's so easy. Most things you get complimented for are hard. Like, oh, he put together that whole play set, which I can't do. That's when I have to bring in the guy and pay him. So, so change all the diapers. That's my, that's my advice to the new dads out there. And there you have it from Scott Yeager, uh, wisdom and advice, new dads, just change the damn diapers. Thank you so much, man, for coming on dad cast. Um, I'm planting the seed. We're doing a father's day episode here in a couple of weeks. It's not going to obviously happen on father's day. We're going to air it on father's day. Um, Nick will be in touch. If that's something you'd be interested in, it's going to be like a Brady bunch episode with a whole bunch of uh, past guests over the past year. Just uh, celebrating us dads, talking about Father's Day and, and all that good stuff. If that's something cool. you'd be interested in, we'd love to let have me you know back if, on the time, then, man. if the time works. And like I said, these days it, it probably will, but right. I have a couple things coming up. But if it doesn't hit with one of those, I'm, I'm there. All cool, right. man. We appreciate it. Awesome. And thank you so much for coming on to everyone listening. Uh, thank you for your support. We love you. We appreciate you. If you're watching on the YouTube, you know what to do like it, hate it, subscribe, whatever you got to do, comment. Do all that good stuff. We appreciate it. And we'll see all of you on the very next episode. Scott Yeager, Challenge Mania podcast. We'll talk to you soon, man. Thank you very much. Peace, guys.